And we're recording. I want to thank all my guests once again for uh, bothering to tune in to my little YouTube channel here and the show on my blog. Uh, I'm really enjoying all of these interviews uh, that I've been doing. And I, and I always say this at the beginning. I'm very excited today. Uh, but today I really am also uh, excited with these guests because we're going to be discussing, before I introduce the guests, the topic that we're going to be discussing is something that is near and dear to my heart. We're going to be discussing the theology of the late, great uh, Father Louis Bouillet, uh, who I think was one of the most important and yet one of the most neglected theologians of the 20th century. Uh, and I want to give a big shout out to my friend James Keating, who teaches uh, at Kenrick Seminary, for first recommending that Monsignor Heinsohn and the three of us talk about uh, seminary formation. But then he said, you have to talk about Bouillet with Keith Lemna and Monsignor Heights. And so here we are. We're going to talk about Bouillet. So big shout out to James Keating. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Monsignor. I mean, you've got to have some clerical privileges here, right, mm -hmm. uh, with the introductions. Uh, my guests, if they go way back, maybe several months, they will remember Monsignor Michael Heinz, who is the academic dean at my alma mater, Mount St. Mary's Seminary and University in Emmitsburg, Maryland, beautiful Emmitsburg, Maryland, I might add. Uh, he also teaches there, teaches patristic, historical theology, Christology. It sounds like you pretty much teach everything. So in in, in just, seminary formation, it's whatever needs to be taught, it's taught. Yeah, and that's kind of the way I was at DeSales University teaching a broad core curriculum to add to undergraduates. It's like, oh, we need somebody to teach this. Okay, there you go. But anyway, uh, Monsignor Heinz got his PhD at Notre Dame, I believe, 2008. Am I right about that? Correct. That is correct. 2008, I think I remember reading that. And that's no easy feat. You must be a brainiac if you graduated from uh, uh, Notre Dame. I have very um, generous teachers. Uh, somebody once joked to me that Notre Dame's PhD program is where doctoral candidates go to die because it's, it's a gauntlet that you have to run. So kudos to you for uh, graduating Notre Dame. But then you also taught at Notre Dame, mm -hmm. uh, what, eight years, 10 years? About, something about, like? a, about a decade, yeah. About a decade. And then you were snatched up by Mount St. Mary's. And you are a priest of the Diocese of South Bend, Indiana. And uh, obviously a scholar of Bouillet. So welcome. Our also our guest, the other guest today here, who did not get first billing here because of clerical privilege, uh, is Dr. Keith Lemna. Dr. Lemna and I have never met before and uh, never been on the show before. But I, I read his book uh, last year, The Apocalypse of Wisdom, which let me look at my cheat sheet here. 2019 was published yes. by Angelical Press. As, and also, and I did not know this actually when I read it, it won the Catholic Press Association Book Award for Philosophy and Theology in 2020. Well, and well deserved because it is a great book. So I highly recommend it. was one of the award winners. Oh, well, yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> but it was an award winner, right? Yes. 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 So let's have no false humility, humility here while I'm trying to sell your books for you, Keith. So the apocalypse of wisdom. Uh, he is associate professor of systematic theology at St. Meinrad School of Theology. So we have two seminary dudes here today. And he too is a, an expert on the theology of Louis, B Louis Bouillet. And he got his doctorate at the Catholic University of America, yeah. yes. which is also a difficult place, I think, to... Uh, to complete a PhD. I did mine at Fordham University, and I would say it was not that difficult. <laughs> so maybe my PhD isn't worth what yours are. It's back when I got my PhD in, in the early 90s, although I did have to fight battles to do a dissertation on Balthazar, but oh, that's man. a different story for Imagine. a different day. Well, it was such a bastion of sort of liberal Ranarian Mm -hmm. you know, hostility towards anything Balthazarian at that time. But anyway, okay, so those are our guests. Welcome. Welcome to today. We're going to be on here for about an hour. And uh, once again, uh, to my viewers, internet here is a little sketchy. So if I suddenly disappear, uh, Monsignor Heinz and Dr. Lemner are going to continue the conversation and, until I can reboot and get back on. But let's keep our fingers crossed that the internet gods will smile on us today. All right, I'm going to start actually with uh, Dr. Lemna. And I'm, and then I want then Monsignor Heinz to sort of piggyback on Dr. Lemna's response, if there's anything that he would like to add. And then I'll flip that next time. I'll start with Monsignor Heinz. But I'm going to start with a very, very a generic question that I discussed with Dr. Lemna before we went on, which is I consider Louis Bouillet 
uh, but, but wait a minute, strike that before we get to my first question. I want one or both of you to give my viewers a brief biography of who Louis Bouillet was. I guess I should put, shouldn't put the cart before the horse here and assume my viewers know who Louis Bouillet was. So, uh, Dr. Lemna, give us a sort of short bio of, of Louis Bouillet. Bouillet was a convert to Catholicism who had been a Lutheran minister who became a Catholic priest and he was an oratorian. He was one of the great theologians of the 20th century, I think of the modern age. And he was a comprehensive theologian who wrote over 50 books and many articles, while also, at least for a good chunk of his career, doing a lot of teaching. And I think he's, now I focus on his work in dogmatic theology, and I think he's one of the most important dogmatic theologians that we have from the century. He did a comprehensive nine volume work on systematics. And I think that's the capstone of his career, but he was also an expert in liturgy and scripture and Newman, modern literature. He didn't publish a lot of stuff in his lifetime on modern literature, but he does have some unpublished work on that. I mean, he's kind of like Balthazar in that regard. But, oh yeah. Um, so he has this massive realm of expertise. He puts it all together in a dogmatic context through nine volumes that he completed over a roughly 40 year period from, I think, 1957 to 1994. And he's a, I would add, he's also, I think, the Catholic theologian who most showed how the sociological direction of thought can be brought into Catholic theology in a dogmatic perspective, at least among 20th century theologians. And so, I mean, he's just a, he's, he's a theologian in the grand style of, you know, Rahner and Balthazar. Well, yeah. I, I, I like to say, uh, Rusty Reno at first things likes to refer to that, uh, that time period in Catholic mm -hmm. theology, he calls it the greatest generation uh, yeah. of Catholic theologians. And, uh, it was, there was just that powerful flourishing of Catholic Mm -hmm. arts, literature, philosophy, yeah. theology in the middle part of the 20th century. Uh, I mean, that we're still assimilating uh, over yes. time. Mons Monsignor Heinz, now Louis yes. Bouillet, Father Bouillet, also taught at uh, your institution, Mount St. Saint Mary. Mary. Yeah, for when, several years. What years? Do you remember what years he was uh, at Mount St. Mary's? Early, 19, early 1980s. Uh, but uh, I don't know the precise. I mean, I've looked through the old catalogs and I talked to, uh, there's a professor at the Mount who's been there for 40 two years uh hmm. father michael roach who's taught church he's a pastor in baltimore's <laughs> taught church history there forever you will remember him i um, remember father roach absolutely and yes, i remember I him fondly him once, i asked him once uh you know i, I did I, no one there no one's been there long enough to, to remember father Bouye being there although archbishop glory of baltimore remembers driving him to uh the airport from time to time when he was a student mm -hmm. at the mount taking father Bouye to, to the airport but uh Michael Roach said that the, the, the tragedy was that he came to the mound for several years and guys were reluctant to take him because he had a thick accent. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How typical. Now, look, I was at Mount St. Mary's 1982 to 1986, and he was not. Right, must have been right before you got there. Late yeah, I yeah. think. Yeah, I think I must. Geez, I must have just missed him. And uh and that, that is probably the greatest tragedy of my whole life, that I did not have the opportunity to sit into that class with his thick accent. <laughs> uh, uh, but to give Father Roach my best, if you, if, if you yes. will, if you, if, when, you, when you see him. He's, retire, he's retiring this year as pastor. He's aged, I think he's in his he's 75. I mean, he's a remarkable man. But yes, I will do that. A great man and, a, and an even greater priest, I think. Uh, fantastic guy. But I, I want to return. I, I want to ask both of you this question, but now I'll return uh, to Dr. Lemna. Why is it, do you think, that so many people have heard of Ratzinger and they've heard of De Lubach and they've heard of Hans Urs von Balthasar, uh, for better or for worse? But there you bring up the name Louis Bouillet, and all of a sudden, people who know about those guys kind of get this vacant stare in their face and say, Who? Why is that? Yeah, well, I can't hear that as I was telling you, as I was, you know, thinking about doing him for my doctoral dissertation 20 years ago that um, I couldn't find anybody on the faculty who really knew his thought in depth. 
other than, as I was saying, Joseph Kamanchak, who wasn't interested in the part of his work that I was wanting to work on. And I, I'm not entirely sure what the answer to that is. I mean, I, I wonder, would we know about Rotzinger if he hadn't been head of the CDF and then Pope? I mean, how, how widespread was his theology? How, yeah. how well known was it before he became, you know, a cardinal and, a, and an ecclesial hierarchy? That's a very, that's a very yeah. good point because he had that, the book that made a big splash, Introduction yeah. to Christianity there in the late 60s. That's uh, true. But Bouillet but, had books like that too, you know. So, but Bouillet, I was just yeah. going to say, but Bouillet had a couple of books like that as well. Yeah. So maybe you are correct. Uh, no, but that, I mean, some of the others, I don't, I don't know that his, he doesn't, or he hadn't been stuck. Now, by the way, I should say, there's a lot of work being done on him now. And not necessarily in the U.S., but there was a, in fact, there's a Bouillet group in Paris that meets three times a year. And there are events at monasteries in France during the summer. There was one at saint Andre Monastery where Bouillet was brought into the church where he's buried just a few weeks ago, where they had several scholars who were doing their dissertations on Bouillet from Brazil and Lebanon and France in the U.S. So, I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff being written on him now, I should say. So there's a kind of Bouillet renaissance going on there is. right now. But uh, 20, 20 years ago, that hadn't yet hadn't yet happened. I, I think one reason why there was the kind of conflict he had after the council, he was very much critical of the way the council was being implemented. That probably played a role, except you also have that in De Lubac and and Baltazar. Oh, absolutely. And, and they're they're much or they used to be much more known than Bouillet. I think one of the reasons why he wasn't known as much, I don't think people realize the scope of what he had com completed in dogmatic theology. Yeah. I, I think he was known as a liturgist, a, a historian of spirituality, scholar of Newman, but people didn't know how he brought it all together in, in that nine volume work on systematic theology. So the systematic theologians weren't really studying him. And yeah. I think that situation has changed. There have been comprehensive studies of Bouillet done now in the last 15 years. And so it's people true. can see the scope of his work. I'm not, I'm not sure that the scope of his accomplishments was understood. And now that that is the case, I think you're seeing more studies of him being done. Very good. Monsignor Heinz, do, yes, do you want to? It seems to me, I think, Dr. Lemon is, is absolutely right. I, th I think also the fact that the, the work I have his that I know the least is the systematic stuff. I focus on his historical, spiritual, liturgical. That's just where I've kind of spent my energies. And I have to put up front, I, I would not consider myself a scholar. I'm an, if I am, I'm an amateur. That is, I fell in love with Bouillet because of his capacity to bring to speech and articulate convictions that I've deeply held, but which were not able, that I could not raise the level of articulation. And I find myself, I found myself when I first started reading Boy more seriously about 15 years ago, I would be reading him and I'd come across, that's exactly the way that should be said, or that's exactly the way that should be articulated. He had the capacity to, to, to and in a way that, that holds things that are intention, intention without damaging either element. He's, he's got a marvelous capacity to articulate truth in a way that's nuanced and yet not abstruse and so I, I that's that's what drew me to him initially and i also think so the, the part i know least is the systematic and i think that's the part that's been most neglected um and i think some of that comes from the fact that only recently has some of the, have some of these things been translated and i think there's at least one or two volumes of the systematic work that have not been translated yet into english and i think that makes mm -hmm. a uh, that's that's a significant part i mean there was a big commitment on the part of ignatius to bring into english Balthazar's massive work and mm -hmm. you know Nichols and others were involved in translating it there was a commitment from the press to put it all in one series no singular American press had that or English press yeah. had that kind of interest in Bouillet's work and I think the publishing had something as a piece of That's that true yeah yeah you just uh you anticipated the point I was just going to make which was what if Joe Fessio Father Fessio instead of throwing all of those resources into translating Balthazar had instead translated Bouillet I'm not saying he should have. I'm saying had he done so, yeah. we would probably be sitting here talking about why is this Balthazar guy so ignored? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. German uh, is hard. Because German is hard. Yes. <laughs> oh, tell me about it. 
my uh, the late great Ed, Father Edward Oakes, when I was doing my dissertation on Balthazar, I was hoping to just rely on the English translated stuff that was already out there. But he insisted, no, you have to read all the German bits. And uh, that's why it took me four years to write my dissertation, because I spent most of it translating. Uh, but anyway, I think that's all true with regard to Bouillet. And not all the volumes of his uh, systematic theology have been even now translated right. into English, right? I would, I would especially point to his book. He has a great book on pneumatology. I think it's one of the best single volumes ever written on that subject. Has not been translated. It was going to be translated, and I don't know what happened, by St. Bede's Publications. You know about, I don't know if they're... Peterson, they're still, Peterson and, uh, Massachusetts. Do you know whatever happened with that? Because that, that would be a really important book yeah. to bring out in English. I, I'm, I'm working currently on translating his dissertation. Ah. Uh, on yeah. Athanasius and yes. theology, which okay. is very short, but it's, it's yes. definitely translated. So I'm actually, yeah. uh, I'm working with Emmaus Academic to have that published. Hmm. So uh, I've started working on that in my fits and starts when I have the free time to do it. But uh, hmm. his his work is, is so important. And there, there are elements of his stuff that have simply never been translated. Yeah. All right. So um, a lot of my viewers might be sitting out there going, okay, we've established that Bouillet is a great theologian should be better known, isn't that well known, has something to do with translations and so on, and there is a renaissance going on. Some, but a lot of them might be saying to themselves, okay, why is Bouillet significant? So let, let's maybe dig down into that now, beyond the question of why isn't he more known, into what it was that he actually accomplished, theologically speaking. Monsignor, I, I want to begin with you, uh, so I, I kind of want to focus on what each one of you sort of knows best about Bouillet. Uh, and so I'm, I'm going to save the sociology and the metaphysical stuff for Dr. Lemna. But I want to start with Thank you. sort of... Thank you. <laughs> I want to start he with... Knows the that, he knows that extremely well, and I don't. Yep. Yeah, and uh, I don't... I mean, I, I've, I've read Bouillet a little bit that's in English here and there, uh, but I certainly don't have a global view uh, sort of sort of like I do with Balthazar or De Lubac of, of their system, so to speak. So I, I kind of want to do a dumpster dive here and kind of get into what is unique about Bouillet. So let's I do know, for example, that Bouillet was one of the first liturgical theologians or liturgical scholars who developed this notion that of, of the Paschal mystery. Right. And and that it is central to our understanding of liturgy to understand those events of Holy Week all sort of standing together and not in isolation as in forming the entire sort of liturgical edifice. Am I wrong about this? Is that a mischaracterization? or No, no. The, the term Paschal Mystery, at least in Catholic parlance, is a relatively modern term right. as a unit. I mean, I, I made the point that I think Melito of Sardis' uh, Paschal Homily actually speaks of the same thing, the mystery of the past. He's talking about it the same way I think Bouillet is coming to, to, to express it. I think that's also related to his ongoing, uh, let me step back for a moment. I, I think the thing that makes Bouillet what's distinctive perhaps is the very nature of how he understands what theology is. And it's, he, he's not easily categorized, and this is wonderful, as he's a systematic theologian, he's a biblical theologian, he's a spiritual, He's, is he those? Yes. And he would be appalled, I think, at the hyper-specialization, compartmentalization that we see in so much of contemporary theology. And he, like a de Lubac or a Ratzinger or a Balthazar, their formation intellectually was so much richer and broader than we're capable of assimilating today. They, they just knew so much more and read so much more than so many contemporary minds. And I'm not trying to castigate the current situation. Just what they read and their, their, their dive into the tradition, into the scripture. I mean, he began as a student of Oscar Kuhlmann, and his first book was on the fourth gospel. It's a commentary, uh, which I use regularly, actually, when I preach. Uh, but, you know, then, then he ventures into the word. His, his dissertation of the, is, is on the ecclesiology and, uh, and incarnation in, in uh, Athanasius. Um, he has that history of spirituality. He then goes on, and I think that the systematic, as I think Dr. Lemma is quite right, it's the crowning achievement, the capstone of his 
long process of assimilating and articulating the tradition. So as having said that, I think the notion of Pascal mystery in him is deeply linked to his understanding of the Pauline mystery. What is Paul talking about? He's got that book came out in, I think, 85, might be 85 in English, uh, The Christian Mystery, in which he wants to debunk the idea that the Pauline language of mystery is simply cribbed from the mystery of religions, and that Paul has a very distinct understanding that's deeply scriptural, deeply rooted in the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures. Can, uh, can, I, can I interrupt for one second? Sure, please, please. Where he hits at that Pauline notion of the mystery of religion. If memory serves, didn't Jungmann make a, 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 a big deal about that? And, and is, would this be one area where maybe Bouillet and, and Jungmann disagree? Uh, possibly Odo Kazel was the one who would also... Oh. It's Odo Kazel. Yeah, I, I, I'm thinking of Kazel. I'm yeah, sorry. That's, a, yeah. Yeah, that's the earlier... Yeah, earlier in the yeah I'm thinking of he Kazel. Would, he would definitely part ways with that, that sort of history of religious yeah. school, yeah. which would see the Pauline articulation as just one more piece of the ongoing development and sort of awakening to this that, that all that all humans experience, that there's something, again, like Balthazar, I think Boyer has a very, prof and Rotsing, a very profound sense of the divine initiative and revelation. It's not the product of sort of, sort of a Whig notion of human development intellectually to get to a point where we've discovered this. It had to be some kind of divine inbreaking into time and space to make this known. And so I think that, that his reflection on Pascal mystery, which is very early on in his you know, his life as a theologian, uh, and then his sort of capstone work on the question of mystery in the early 80s shows the development of how he's reflecting on this as a central, like, what is the central mystery of the Christian faith? Jesus Christ dead and risen. Um, and that is the full, well, everything God had to reveal, he's revealed in Christ. Now, that will take all kinds of reflection, unpacking, etc. But there is no substituting for reducing from the, the person of Jesus Christ as the center of Bouillet's theological vision and understood in very Pauline terms. I mean, it's interesting. I was talking recently to, uh, I was giving a conference to some priests uh, out East. And one of the things I think that, that the Catholic and Orthodox readers of Paul and Protestant evangelical fundamentalist readers of Paul differ in their hermeneutic or approach in that I would say for Boyer, the access point to, for Paul is Ephesians and Colossians. Mm. That's, so they provide the hermeneutic. Many contemporary post-Lutheran, you know, Protestant readers of Paul will begin with Romans and Galatians as setting the hermeneutic for reading all of Paul's letters. And I think Boyer's, and I think that that's largely the, the Latin and certainly the Eastern tradition accessing Paul much more, Corinthians, Colossians, Ephesians, than Galatians, Romans, as sort of the key portal through which you want to enter and read Paul. Um, so I've said plenty there. I'm sorry. Talk to, I can talk and talk and talk. So, but, but thank you. I don't know if that answered oh, your question, but. Well, it, it did with regard to the, you know, the missed Paschal mystery. Um, mm -hmm. And before I, I, I go to uh, Dr. Lemna, I want to then talk about, to stay on the theme of, of liturgy, uh, much has been made. And of course, perhaps this does then harken back to the question of Bouillet's marginalization to an extent much has been made of the fact that Paul VI really liked Bouillet and put him on the, you know, the commission that revised the Roman liturgy. Uh, and we get the Novus Ordo. And of course, Bouillet worked with the infamous Bugnini and all this. And uh, it's, it's, there's a current sort of trope out there in the traditionalist world, right, that, uh, that Bouillet uh, sort of utterly and completely opposed the Novus Ordo, was appalled by it, and uh, didn't like the liturgical reforms that we actually got. Uh, is is that trope? Is that trope? I, I don't think it's entirely false. Obviously, he had criticisms of the reform, but I, I would also wager a guess, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that Bouillet did believe that the old, what we call in a shorthand, the Tridentine liturgy, needed to be reformed. Right? Absolutely. If you read. Uh... Two things I would observe. One, there's some very sort of almost comical, satirical portrayals of a liturgy that needs reform when you have someone chanting a lesson from Paul in a language that no one understands away from the congregation and toward a pillar. I think it's, he described it at one point. You know, that, that <laughs> Boyer's concern about full active and conscious participation does not mean that everybody who comes to church has to have a liturgical role and be up there doing something. Full conscious active participation, Bouillet's mind meant to, to worship with understanding. What is it that's, that we are experiencing when we, we are at the Mass? And that was his central concern. 
Certainly, I think there are legitimate uh, criticisms that one can find in Bouyer of the manner in which the reforms, liturgically and in other areas, were implemented. Uh, but I would also say that I don't want to see Bouyer hijacked by those who would uh, make uh, ill use is probably too strong a term, but misuse of Bouyer's concerns for a different for a different agenda. I would point readers and, and listeners to a little book he wrote in 1965, like December 8th or 9th of 1964, Sacrosanctum and Chilium is promulgated. Early 65, he writes a little book called The Liturgy Revived, which is a glowing and laudatory commentary on Sacrosanctum Concilium. So whatever Bouyer's concerns are about liturgical reform, it has nothing to do with what the council actually proposed and put forth. So his concerns, from my experience, from the things I've read of him, I've not read everything he wrote, of course, but that his concerns are legitimate in that there were methods that were used during the concilium in which he served after the council. There were some shady characters. There were decisions made, for example, dropping the Pentecost octave, you know, that were, that were, were not good moves. And the implementation was not executed uh, as, nearly as well as he would have hoped or liked. That does not invalidate what he saw as a necessary and beautiful reform that was envisioned in Sacrosanctum Concilium. Yeah. And since he so emphasized full conscious participation in the liturgy, uh, would I be right in assuming that therefore he was a supporter of Mass in the vernacular with prayers said out loud? Well, I would say yes, certainly with prayers. I mean, he pointed out that the, in his, uh, where did I read that? In one of, one of his, his books on the liturgy, no, he's certainly about the, the, the silent canon. He saw that largely as an aberration. Um, and at least the readings in English. I mean, he might make yeah. the case that the canon could be in, Fran in, in Latin yeah. or in, in yeah. vernacular. Rather. You know, like the reading should be in the vernacular. He was certainly, the idea is that people need to understand the word of God. And um, I don't think he would be arguing that the, the, that the mass itself must necessarily always be in the vernacular. I think okay. that would be but I do think he would say the reading certainly should be in the vernacular. Okay, very most good. Of time, most of the time. Now, Dr. Lemda, do you have anything that you want to add to the liturgical elements of this conversation? Well, it opens up wider considerations of how he understands tradition and his critiques of progressivism and integralism. Do you want to talk about that at this point? Well, sure, that's what absolutely. I'm, that's what I'm thinking about. Yeah, absolutely. That would be fantastic, actually. Well, his whole sense of tradition is such that the race source mont dimension and the aggiornamento dimension are not sundered. They're integrated. So we have to always root our adaptations, our renewals, our reformations, which are always needed in the deepest wellspring of the tradition. He's very clear about this. And one, one of his criticisms of liturgical reform as it's being implemented on the local level is too many people are trying to fabricate on the spot productions that are not sufficiently rooted in the tradition. So, so the race source mod is crucial for the development of tradition. But on the other hand, we don't just recover the tradition as if it's a set of museum pieces that are handed on and we don't touch them and we don't assimilate them or, or appropriate them in our own context. And this kind of critique of false notions of tradition which don't see it as having to be rooted in the in the wellspring of divine revelation or that think of it as just something that can be fixed at a particular point is just present throughout his writings and i think we have a real problem with this in in the united states i don't know how widespread it is globally but in the u.s i think one of the reasons we're in this kind of dialectical polarity is because we tend to stress one over the other as if they can't be integrated and i've seen that you know even in my seminary so oh yeah i think yeah. i think he i think what he does is really important really balanced in this regard and he does have as monsignor was saying you know the sharp criticisms of of the way that the liturgy was being being um changed after the council on the local level but that should not be made to make him a figure who's co-opted for one political agenda or another. I, th I think he really does show us a way beyond those those polar ideological traps 
that we find ourselves in. So I, I think I think that's a really crucial part of his thought. But he's like Baltazar and De Lubach, and I think Rotzinger in this regard. Um, yeah. He adds to this. He adds to this this cloud of witnesses who show us a way beyond. This kind uh, of yeah, I mean, hilarious. we can throw in a bunch of other names: Daniel mm -hmm. Liu, Guardini. Mm -hmm even philosophers uh, like Peeper and so on. Oh, it looks like, okay, we lost Monsignor. Hopefully he'll be back soon. Uh, and, and so, the, I mean, there's this great flourishing of these resource mont thinkers, of course, and, and Bouillet would be one of them. Uh, it, it seems to me, too, every single time I talk about some of these resource mont guys, whether it's Guardini or Bouillet or Balthazar or Ratzinger, Daniel Liu or Congar, or any of them, is, okay, he's asking to be let back in, so we will do Good. so. Apologies to my uh, viewers. Just a little glitch here. Just be patient. Uh, internet is a funny thing. And that was a problem on his end. Sorry, All that, right. was, that was my internet. Sorry about that. Yeah, that's fine. I, I, there's a lot of wind blowing, I see, in, in the background <laughs> out your window yeah. there. So maybe you're having a little, a little uh, sorry, wind so problem. Sorry about that. Hey, don't worry. I thought it was going to be me that would get be bounced off. Yeah. Uh, while you were gone, we were discussing the fact that you know, Bouillet is a part of this cloud of witnesses uh, of this greatest generation of, of theologians, philosophers, even literary figures like Bernanos and Moriac and, and people. And then little forgotten guys, even like Carl Adam and, and people like that. Uh, and even going back to the 19th century, Shaban, people like that. It, it, it's it's um, one of the things that I that I would contend with and, and, say, and say is that going all the way back to Blondell and before. What, what we're struggling with and continue to struggle with is this is this dialectic, this relationship between transcendence and imminence, mm -hmm. nature and grace, God and world. And you've got sort of the progressives on one wing that are maybe overly Hegelian or world philosophical. And then you've got the integralist Catholic sort of hardliners on the other end who maybe have an overly propositionalist view of revelation and, and so on. So my, my thinking is, is that, okay, Vatican II opted for the resource mont solution to the, to the horns of that dilemma, and yet it didn't work. It didn't catch. It didn't take. Something fell through the cracks. Do, do, it, it, did either one of you want to comment on that? Do you, do you think I'm off in left field there or, or, or what? Monsignor Heinz, what do you think of that? Well, I don't know. I think we're still sorting that question out. I don't think, it's a, I don't think the question's – it hasn't been answered – perfectly well i think and but i think it's something it's you know we this goes this goes to the liturgical question as well we live yes. at a remove of 60 years from the council i i sus subscribe to matt levering's contention that the, the segmentic council is an ongoing theological event that it's still being appropriated and that it's it like trent you know whose liturgical forms were implemented in france in some places for 250 years after the council we're still seeing what this the implementation of the council. So I think we're still in the wake of the council, and and I'm not saying we're going to have new doctrines or, or new statements, but rather what does this? What is the full meaning of Dave Erbum, you know, Lumen Gentium? I think I think Dave Erbum is one of the most important documents in the entire history of the church. Not read enough, and not studied enough in Catholic theology, and. Lumen Gentium as well. Like, what, how are these being assimilated? What does that mean? So I think some of it is an ongoing conversation. It's something that's decided. I think there's some on both ends who'd like to just ditch. They they think yeah. they've got the question figured out, and let's just ditch the mm -hmm. conversation. Whether you're an integralist or you know, uh, you know, just someone who's uh, who doesn't really believe in final causality. I think that's how I would describe the basic okay. problem with most contemporary thought is that it doesn't understand final causality. That's a whole other issue. Yes, and so I mean, and and and, and Bouillet, located in that theological movement, would would say that in order to appropriate the council, in order for this ongoing rolling appropriation to take place, uh, in in one sense, resource mont, broadly defined, is simply a return to scripture and the fathers, and, and the medievals of the the entirety of the broad tradition. And Thomas, it's, on Thomas's own terms, right rather than through later commentators, exactly. Exactly. Uh, oh, that, that cannot be emphasized, I think, enough. That That is not only a way forward, or maybe even the most favorable way forward, it really is the only option open to us, truly. 
if, if we want to move the theological needle forward, the ecclesial needle, uh, to, to to retrieve this full orbed sort of, and, and and that's why I mean, I love the fact that you both have emphasized in in many ways what a Renaissance man, kind of the, theologically speaking, Bouillet was, because true to his methodology, it, he didn't compartmentalize. He wanted to 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 look at each of you know, patristics, scripture philosophy, you know, systematics, all those sorts of things. I think that's very important. But that, that then brings me, Dr. Lemna, to, okay, big picture, mm. sort of, this is what I call big picture Bouye. Um, if memory serves, Bouye was a, uh, a, a big fan of the uh, Russian Orthodox theologian Bulgakov. Yes. And to a certain extent, I think, Lasky, am I am I wrong about that? Yes, I don't well, know. Friend, he was actually friends with both of them to some extent. He knew them. Okay, he's responsible okay. for getting Lasky or for getting Bulgakov's trilogies and dogma translated into French. And he met with Bulgakov. Um, he met he, he he met with Lasky too. Each of them right before they died, he had long conversations with them. So yes. Um, so, but but Lasky was not completely on board with Bulgakov's no. sophiological approach, no. if I'm correct. No, uh, I keep saying, if I'm correct, but this is one yeah, time I'm doing that. an interview where I'm really learning from my guests a lot right. because I, I only know sketchy things about, about Bouye, uh, but enough to know that I love him. Uh, and, and so, but Bouye definitely has this love affair with, with sophiology, if, if, if you don't mind me putting it that way. How does, how does Bouye, in his systematic theology, in his metaphysics, what does it mean when we say that Bouye was sympathetic with a sophiological approach? Sort of hammer that out for us. What exactly does that mean? Well, I'm, actually, I'm in the midst of a trilogy of books on Bouye. I have one coming out at the end of the year on his Trinitarian theology of wisdom. And then down the road, I hope to do a third book on sophiology and mythopoetic thinking and Bouye's thought. But the way I would, I would want to answer that question is with what I'm doing on the, in the second book that's coming out. I think it's, it's really about trying to understand the God world relationship with respect to what some have called the theme of mediation and I mean, lots of commentators on sociology have said that's what this this movement in theology is about. Though there's an incommensurability between creation and the creator, creation is not just the pure opposite of God. It's not just the opposition. There's not, there's not this oppositional relationship between the divine and the created, especially in humanity, in the image of God. And sociology tries to develop a positive understanding of the intrinsic bond that creation has with the creator and it develops this understanding with respect to a at least in dogmatic theology i mean if you have like michael martin on or something i don't know if he, i know michael he's, martin he's, studying, yeah. he's studying uh jacob bohm and 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 sophiology outside of dogmatic theology but in dogmatic theology with bulgakov and bouye sophiology is is utilized with respect to the distinction and unity of uncreated and created wisdom that you find in St. Athanasius. And, and Monsignor Michael will know about this from Bouye's dissertation on Athanasius. So you have the distinction and unity of uncreated and created wisdom. Wisdom is like the link piece between God and creation. It really is about trying to find the proper balance of transcendence and imminence that you were talking about, Larry. Yeah. I, I, think, I think this is the key of, of what this approach is doing. And so I'm exploring that in the second book. The first book I did on the cosmology, there's another aspect of sophiology. And that's what the first book I did really focus on, which is the a kind of unified vision of creation, the how God, humanity, and the cosmos are, are intertwining realities in the Christian vision of the divine mystery centered on the incarnation of Christ. B.A. himself once said of Bulgakov that his whole thought is a theology of of cosmic and anthropological deification reflecting from the cross and i think wow. that's what bouye is trying to develop in his systematic theology he doesn't do the sophiology theme in any depth until he gets to those volumes on systematic theology but already in the 1950s he did his first volume was on mary and he's already read bulgakov by that point 
And by the way, I've, I've been to San Juan Dree where he doesn't have archives, but he does have briefcases where he, his journals are found. And every day of his scholarly life, he would write in, here's what I read and here's who I met with. And by the way, he was meeting with Baltazar all the time. And, and I saw that he had read Bulgakov by the time he got around to writing his book on Mary. And I already knew that he had encountered Bulgakov in Paris when Bouvet was a Lutheran ministry student. So, so I know that he's encountered Bulgakov. He's read his work. He has a broad understanding of it, critical of it in some ways, critical of certain Bemonite themes that are, are still in Bulgakov, although he doesn't completely condemn that extra canonical non-dogmatic tradition either. But it's this theme of mediation and also of unity of creation and salvation centered on the incarnation by not downplaying the cross. By, you know, you know the cross is the, the intervention of God. It's not, it, it's, a, it's a surprising intervention of God. Um, Balthazar, toward the end of his life, as you may know, gave a, a talk, Was it, I think it was at CUA, where he said that he belongs to the school of those yes. who are overwhelmed by the word of God the way the beloved is by the declarations of the lover. And so that's very much, I think Monsignor Michael was getting at that earlier, that's very much part of how Bouye appropriates the sociological theme, not by trying to fit the incarnation or the cross into some kind of pre-existent religion or into, you know, the a priori conditions of transcendental subjectivity or anything like that. <laughs> but nevertheless, not, not, not denying that there are continuities too. And so the wisdom theme really stresses that, you know, Maximus the Confessor's theme of the cross of Christ is sort of the fabric of God's intentionality for creation from the beginning. I mean, all this is present in Bouye. So, I mean, I, yeah. these these are the things that he's getting at. I mean, I could also go into the mythopoetic dimension of experience and how that's a sociological theme, Ooh. which I learned from Michael Martin, by the way. Oh, well, I, Michael it, Martin's a smart guy. I, I had yeah. uh, Mike Sauter on here a couple of weeks ago, and he's into sociology, and mm -hmm. I've been dying to get Mike Martin on here, but I haven't reached out to him yet. Uh, but I'd love to talk with him about these sorts of things. Uh, and I remember, too, the first time as a, as a young Balthazar scholar, I read uh, Balthazar's COA talk. And, you know, it, what, what really struck me was for the first time, it hit me that within this broad category that you call resourcement theology, there, there are subspecies of that and subcategories. And that Balthazar didn't automatically lump him in with his good buddy De Lubac or Ratzinger. Yeah. He felt that stronger affinity with that sort of tradition, the, what is almost monastic, mystical tradition yeah. of being overwhelmed by the lover. Uh, and in, in that sense, he sided with, he, he specifically mentions Bouillet. Monsignor, do you have anything that you would like yeah. to, to add? No, I think Dr. Lem, I, I learned, I'm learning from Dr. Lem as well. I look forward to the next book, so thank you. Um, I, I, I think some of it comes down to formation. That is to say, you know, Bouillet, where does he land? He lands in Paris. St. Sergius is there. Like, had he not been teaching in Paris, these contacts might not have had the kind of influence on him that they came to have. Um, you know, his formation, like Ratzinger's, was not in a scholastic Roman seminary. So he, his formation intellectually uh, was in a, of a very different cast uh, from, uh, same with John Paul, who's worked in, in Poland. Uh, you know, he certainly studied at the Ange with uh, Gargo Lagrange, but he also had done all kinds of personal stuff in Poland. Their formation was such that there was a, a, a capacity to think out of the side of their contemporaries' box, so to speak. And I think some of it is, is owed to that. And I think, like, just talk about, like, Vatican II as an ongoing theological appropriation or event. Even the way, one of the ways I, I see this being signaled in the life of the church, and it's been very gradual over the last 50 or 60 years, is what biblical theology or what scriptural studies is coming to be, coming to be in Catholic life. Um, you know, 25, 30 years ago, scriptural dissertations were on an obscure Akkadian verb in, you know, uh, a text <laughs> of the prophet, or two lines in Mark with three variants from, you know, you know a papyrus. 
that's really important work. Don't get me wrong. That pick and shovel work is essential. That's not theology. And what you're seeing now in, in the area of scripture is more and more Catholic scripture scholars doing the pick and shovel work, but actually engaging theologically with the text, mm. not just history. They took the, they taking the second half of Dave Urban 12 seriously, which is, you know, you, you do the archaeological, historical, literary, but the analogy of faith, the narrative unity, all of that stuff is coming to play. So I think we're seeing the fruits of that appropriation in one area, and that is in scriptural theology. That's my view. Hmm. Well, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, 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 I double down and triple down on that. And I agree also with your previous statement that I think Dei Verbum is, is one of the most uh, important documents uh, ever written in the history of the church, and we, we could really dive deeply in, into that conversation as well. By the uh, way, that's I wanna... something that Bouye agreed with that too. That was oh Bouye's yes, view. he did. I do know that about yeah. Bouye. Uh, and, and by the way, when I said earlier I'm learning something from these guys, unlike my other guests, I didn't mean to imply that I'm smarter than all my other <laughs> guests. So my, what I meant was, this is one area where I really am floundering a bit. I don't. I, I'm, I'm a to complete amateur when it comes to Bouye. And I consider myself. I, I consider myself a student of Bouye. I just keep learning and reading and. Um, I've learned a ton from him and I can everything I read from him. I learned something. He has so much. Yeah, to offer. that's, that's true. I want to come to, uh, let's see what time is it? Okay. We've got maybe, uh, another 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes. Uh, the, uh, the, qu the, the question of ecclesiology and, uh, mm. Dr. Lemon, you, uh, that relates too to the question of pneumatology, which, which you mentioned mm. before that Bouillet has an important book. Now, one of the books that, of, of Bouillet's that I have really systematically gone through with a fine-tooth mm. comb is his book, The Church of God, uh, which I think is an unbelievably profound text. And I, I just wonder if, if I want to get the, the take on both of, uh, both of your take, and especially since we've been talking about Dei Verbum and the sources of Revelation as well, and you were talking about tradition. What, what is... What is, if you wanted to sort of in, in sort of nutshell and encapsulate it, what was Bouillet's essential ecclesiological vi vision? And we'll start with you, Dr. Lem, and then go down to, to Monsignor Heinz. Well, that's a that's a, a very interesting question off the top. This would be off the bat here. Um, and, and as I think about this a few hours from now, I might change my mind. And I'm sorry but, to put you on the spot. This is part of the unscripted um, part here, but it just, it popped into my head. So if you have thoughts, go ahead. I think, I think he has a... A, as I focused on his meta, the metaphysical dimension of his work, I think he has a really wonderfully balanced view of the church as body and the church as bride and temple of the spirit. Yes. And he, he, he has a strong sense of the interlinking of creation, incarnation, Eucharist in the church. That's a sociological conjunction of themes, but it's also patristic. And yeah. he draws that out very nicely I know, I, I think you mentioned in an email, his, his critique of the ecclesiology of power is really important. We need more of an ecclesiology of ministry rather than power. And this yes. is something that fits in very nicely with his overarching view of the church's body and bride of Christ. And by the way, it's rooted in a Trinitarian understanding of God as a, as a, as self-giving love and how creation is meant to to model the divine life and how the church is to do so as the sort of center of God's providential plan for creation. In, in a sense, the church is the principle of creation, according to Bouye. And you can find that in certain church fathers. And so, I mean, I don't, I don't have one thing that I'm just going to pull out. But, the, but those know, are all good things. Um, yeah. I, I really like how the body theme and the bride theme, come together in in the book so the body and that's focuses, yeah go ahead. that's very central in balthazar as well so mm -hmm. this is one of the areas where the i mean there was a one of the central chapters of my dissertation which was on balthazar's theology of revelation was precisely on the the marian subjectivity of the church mm -hmm. uh and and what as a sort of counterpoint to the church's body of christ it's also bride of christ uh, and that that interplay, I think, is unbelievably important. You, and, and I, I think it's it's throughout uh, throughout Balthazar's theology. I think it's mm -hmm. also throughout Bouillet's uh, theology. Yeah, it is, um, Monsignor. I, I, um, I want to ask you um, 
Towards the end, you, you mentioned earlier, you said Bouillet, I think it was you, Bouillet had this wonderful capacity for being, yeah, it was you, to hold things in tension, right? While doing full, not in a facile sort of, you got this and you got that and the truth is somewhere in the middle. No, 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 no. Really holding things in tension while doing justice to both things. And uh, what struck me was, I remember towards the end of his book, The Church of God, Bouillet talks a lot about Eastern Orthodoxy, and he talks about how wounded the church has become because of the schism between the two sides of the church. And he, and he goes on and he starts saying, it does in some sense cause us Catholics to pause for a moment and to look at all of our ecumenical councils since the schism and to realize that even though they are valid councils, there is nevertheless something missing in them, which is the voice of the East. And when you were talking about him holding two things in tension, that really, that aspect of his thought really leapt out in my mind. Here he is, a, you know, a, a devout Roman Catholic saying, no, you need the Roman magisterium. These councils are valid. On the other hand, there is something deeply lacking in everything in the Western church since the schism. Now, I might be putting words in Bouillet's mouth to a certain extent. I might be reading my own hobby horse into that. But do you, do you have anything you, you want to comment on that? I, I, I think you're I think you can hold both those things in tension because nothing nothing he suggests invalid, as you said, invalidates anything that the councils did. It's right. that a voice was was not heard in those deliberations and conversation, which, again, doesn't invalidate the decisions. But we may be, look, at the, the effect is that as a, the Western Church is to some degree impoverished by a lack of relation with our Eastern, bro Eastern brothers and sisters to some degree. John Paul's talking about breathing both lungs. That's the idea. Like, we, we, we could certainly survive with one lung, okay? But the Church, I think the more we uh, learn from our Eastern brothers and sisters, the richer we become, and vice versa. I mean, they, they've all, it's not just that we're impoverished and they're not. I think there's, there's a lack in their experience as well. Because there's a, this is part of the wonderful diversity of, for all the language of diversity in the world today. The rich diversity of Catholicism is the various rites and and traditions with all within the umbrella of Catholica that all fit. You know, they're all yeah. part of it, yeah. and all, they adorn it. And so I think to say that there's something at least aesthetically at one level and more than that lacking in our experience as as that's why I think it's important for uh, Latin rite. Catholics to experience our Eastern brothers and sisters and engage them in some way. Um, Absolutely. Their lives are richer for it um, and, and vice versa. Um, going back to the, the question about ecclesiology, I think you know, we, we, we live on the other side of the Second Vatican Council's ecclesiology, but you know it, Bouillet's whole approach is to use the language and categories of the scriptures, which are exploited by the fathers, as you know, to talk about the church and it moves away from, we take this for granted now because we don't think in such terms, but it's a way of moving away from the juridical sort of institutionalized model of the church as a juridical, like fundamentally interpreting the church by what its rights, duties, obligations, etc., and the various centers of uh, uh, activity, organization, authority, and power to a dynamic, uh, it's messier in a sense, or it's not quite as crisp as a juridical model of the church. But I think it serves. And look, at we have too many Catholics today who still function. When they think church, they think what? The institution. Yeah. You know, when I, when I do, for example, when I'm doing marriage preparation with a couple that may be on the peripheries of church life, and I talk to them about the vision for marriage that, that is offered and the challenges that are pro, posed to them by the church, I never say the church says, the church asks, the church wants. I always say Jesus asks, the gospel asks, the gospel expects. Not because I don't think the church teaches that, but because when they hear church, what I mean to convey is not what they're hearing. Hmm. They're not Good hearing point. the bride of Christ or the mother that loves them. They're hearing, oh, those corrupt cardinals in Rome. You know, that, that's what they hear. And so, not to, again, not to downplay the language of church, in that particular pastoral moment, that is not the place to introduce language of church. Um, but to introduce hmm. Jesus, this is what Jesus wants us to do. You know. Wow, I, I I could not agree with that more. And before I go back to Dr. Lemna, you know, it just it's it reminds me the reason why I kind of brought this issue up. I mean, Joseph Rodzinger, Pope Benedict, uh, often spoke of the hermeneutic with regard to the Council, the hermeneutic of reform, which is slightly different than a hermeneutic of continuity, because a hermeneutic of reform is going to involve certain small ruptures towards proximate 
distortions in order to retrieve a, 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 a greater element of, of the tradition. So there's going to be sm these little micro ruptures. Uh, so it's not all continuity turtles all the way down. There are little ruptures. And, and what strikes me, therefore, why, why Bouillet's comment in Church of God struck me was that the sort of, it seems to me, the point that Ratzinger is making is similar, which is that it is possible, even if a council is valid, magisterial comments are valid, papal teachings are valid, that a, a certain hypertrophy of certain things can creep in and, and a sort of eclipsing of other things. So I'll say a hypertrophy of the papacy, maybe even a hypertrophy of magisterialism as such, so that if you want to know a the answer to a moral question is, well, what does Rome say? Uh, mm -hmm. Instead of looking at the, the, what does the liturgy say? What does Jesus say? What does the gospel say? What does Aquinas say? What does all of them say? You know, I don't know, what does Rome say? That's what I'm talking about. And then I want Dr. Lemnon to comment on this too, but go ahead, Monson. Well, just very briefly, I think this, one of John Paul's greatest contributions to the life of the church was the sort of, the way he could employ the bursting media during his papacy in terms of the modes of communication to become an international figure. And it was for the good, don't get me wrong. He did great yeah. things because of that. The downside of that is also, the, the, the shadow side of that is real, which is this, can, this sort of hanging on every word that comes from the Pope's mouth at every moment. You know, I don't think any Catholic in 1920 was waiting for the latest word from Pius XI. The priests weren't reading, the, maybe the bishops were reading the encyclicals, that might have been a push. They knew his name because he was in the canon, and they might have seen his picture in the back of church, but they weren't hanging on his latest bon mot. You know, like they weren't waiting for. It was an oracle, and I think yeah, that's that, right. And I think that the the oracular papacy is a good thing in some ways, but a dangerous thing in other ways because then what happens is the church's voice is reduced to one man. Now, I'm not suggesting the pope isn't the vicar of Christ on earth with full authority to teach. I don't question any of that, but right. it's how that teaching is communicated. Seminary professors, Dr. Lemna, myself, and others, are teaching what the church teaches. You know, we're also teaching what the church teaches. And um, and I think that Catholicism, for so many people now, is reduced to whatever the, the Pope happens to say tomorrow or yesterday, never contextualized in a broader and richer tradition and context than the authority, authoritative voice. And that, that's true of both left and right. It certainly is. Dr. Right. Lemna. I, I'm thinking of, uh, back to your question regarding the East, one thing that I think is that I should bring out about Bouillet's work is theologically, at a very deep level, he is fruitfully negotiating both Eastern and Western traditions. And this is something that's very unique, I think, about Bouillet's work, particularly with respect to the question of nature and grace. He draws on polemism in a very sympathetic way. And I think sophiology is, a, is presented as a kind of path that integrates Eastern and Western concerns on the God-world relationship. So this integration of East and West, this learning from the East, this, this breathing with both lungs requires really hard, profound theological work. And I think he sets a kind of model for that. So if people you know, are interested in, in delving into his his work, I think this is something that you can really get from it. I think it's already borne some fruit. Adrian Walker and Stratford Caldecott working together produced some things that I think were very much along the lines of what Bouye did on this. Well, I, I wish I had talked to you uh, before. Yeah, I, I just interviewed Rodney Hauser and I interviewed Adrian Walker yesterday. Ah, wow. <laughs> and I'm still waiting. That we, I have to do an edit on his on our on our interview because there were so mm. many Internet glitches. And uh, I'm a complete Luddite and haven't gotten around to it yet. Hmm. Uh, but we, we talked mainly about Maximus the Confessor. With, oh, with okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is a, but uh, I did not know that yeah, he'd done similar things. But it, it doesn't surprise me either. It doesn't yeah. surprise me. Um, but what um, – to, 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 okay, Dr. Lim, to go back then to Bouye, the, the thing is he was also – because he was big into the East and, and he was really mediating – a lot of what was going on in Eastern Christianity to the West and vice versa. Mm -hmm. But then there's two things that I, as we are sort of rolling out of time here, two things. I want to talk about Cardinal Newman and, mm -hmm. and his interest in Newman, but also then 
maybe to what extent, to go back to the question of the East, to what extent would Bouye say that perhaps the East would need the West's uh, development of the concept of analogy, for example? Oh, hmm. Well, first of all, it's interesting. Uh, there's a there's a recent book by Norman Russell, who's a scholar of Palamas, who knew Bouye, and he dedicates the book to Bouye. And he says in the book that, this is kind of interesting historical fact. He says that Bouye once told him that when he was young, it was a choice when he was thinking about converting, it was a choice between following Newman or following Bulgakov. And he chose, <laughs> he chose Newman. But yeah, so he's a great scholar of, I mean, without, you know, denying the greatness of Bulgakov. But yeah, he's a great scholar of Newman and um, Newman's ecclesiology is all over the place in his book, The Church of God, as you know. Yes. Also, he recovers Anglophone Christian Platonism. I've written quite a bit about this, actually, because I find it so fascinating. There's a, there's a tradition of uh, Christian Platonic cosmology that goes back to um, St. Augustine of Canterbury and is developed through the centuries. And Bouye sees Newman as kind of bringing that forward. And so that's that's um, part of what he's doing. I mean, wouldn't you say you also would see that to a certain extent in Tolkien and Lewis? Yes, absolutely. There's another connection. Um, so he read Tolkien in the 50s, and that's part of what he brings into his systematic theology. He, and he can show how what Tolkien and Lewis were doing has roots in Anglophone Christian thought. I mean, it's, it's another tradition, particularly Western tradition, that is part of the great symphony of, of, of the faith that we have to bring forward. Now, your other question was regarding Western thought and analogy. Right. I, I would, could, you, could you flush that out a little bit more? I'm, well, yeah, I'm it, just seems to, well it, it just seems to me that one of the dangers, and I'm a big fan of sociology, which is why mm -hmm. I want to get Mike Martin on here. And I've read Bulgakov and there's a, and, and David Hart's recent book, uh, You Are Gods, uh, sort of dabbles in, in sociology. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, it strikes me that in a lot of that, there is a certain monistic tendency. Yeah. Uh, and that I think that's, I mean, all theological trends have their sort of pitfalls, mm -hmm. their dangers. And I think that's one of the dangers of the East is an over mystification and, 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 a, and a lean towards a kind of pantheistic, almost monistic. They're not pantheists and they're not monists, but you understand what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. And that perhaps, perhaps the West is onto something when you sort of, even before Aquinas, but you really Aquinas being the paradigmatic, paradigmatic example of mm -hmm. the development of the analogy of being right. the, the real distinction between essence and existence as, as real breakthroughs in philosophical thought that, that mm -hmm. can keep our sociology from spinning off into strange directions. That's, that's yeah. what yeah. I'm after here. If you, no, well, if that's, you that all, that, that's part of how he develops sociology in the context of Western dogmatic theology. He's very much, he's, he's pretty Thomistic. I mean, he's even been criticized by Balthasarians for being too Thomistic. Um, so yeah, he, and he's, he's worried about, seeing creation as necessary or as an emanation. Right. He thinks there's a tendency of that in, uh, in the sophiological tradition, even in Bulgakov. And, and so he tries to bring that tradition, maybe also in with respect to Palamite theology, he tries to bring what's good in that into a Western context. He doesn't downplay the Western tradition in the process, in my view, although he has been criticized for being a little too Eastern by some. But I don't think that's true. I think he also has a very strong Western monastic and scholastic uh, background in his thinking that that yeah. takes 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 the sources that you're talking about very seriously and as decisive. But he, I, there's some subtle differences between Bouye and Balthazar on this, but I don't know if I want to get into that. Um, um, well, that might be a conversation uh, for, for a different day. Uh, but maybe you can at least mention one or two before before we sign off here. I think that's interesting as a Balthazarian. Well, I, I, the father scholastics in ourselves, that's yes. not, that's not quite Bouye. 
I mean, I, I, I had, I just, this just popped into my mind. I'd have to go back and read it, but uh, Bouye is very much critical of kind of the way the scholastic theology separates philosophy and theology. And I, I think there's a difference between Bouye and Balthazar on that point. Um, yeah, I, I think what, there, I yeah. think there is too, in the way you've articulated it. If, if memory said what to my viewers, what we're referring to is an article written by Balthazar called the, the Fathers, the Scholastics and Ourselves, mm -hmm. in which he sort of went through a kind of periodization of theological history, pointing out the strengths and weaknesses of the patristics, the medievals, yeah. the moderns and so on. And then, you know, where we are now. And uh, he loved the patristics, but said, eh, maybe they're a little too platonic. OK, yeah. maybe yeah. they're a little too schmeasy in that direction. Mm -hmm. But then he does. He gets to the medievals and it seems to me. Even though he talks a great deal in other venues about the great tragedy in the history of theology was the rupture between philosophy and theology yeah. and the shift from theology being primarily a monastic pastime to a university mm -hmm. pastime was fraught with all kinds of deleterious consequences and the rupturing of theology and holiness, for example. But in that article, the main thing, I mean, he says, we gained great philosophical precision with the scholastics and he thinks that's a great thing the introduction of aristotle yes. was a great thing because it brought this precision that we didn't yes. have before but what he criticizes is more its style that, well, that, that, okay. you know it's the yeah. it's the question and answer format of the yeah. classroom style which he yeah. thought introduced something problematic into the form of theology that's actually true of bouillet as well he thinks that the scholastic well, especially what what he's critical of Aquinas is the style, but he I don't see him seeing a kind of maybe I could be mistaken on this. I'm I'm not sure that that there's anything in Bouillet that points to the the advance of the scholastic. I, maybe there is, but it's not as it's it's not as pointedly stated in anything that he wrote that I'm aware of. Right, as, right. as in the Father Scholastics and ourselves, Monsignor. Not, yeah. Uh, I just, I just okay, go ahead, finish your thought, Dr. Lemon, and then I'm going to go down to Monsignor. I mean, he's he's very much in line with Aquinas on his fundamental positions in many areas, but I, I don't see him writing about the scholastics as 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 a step forward in the same way. That I agree with, and that's the kind of the point I was trying to make. Balthazar is saying the scholastics represent a step forward, mm -hmm. but a step forward that came with X, Y, Z consequences, which sure. were yes. also bad. Mm -hmm. And so that would be a difference. Monsignor Heinz, do you have anything that you uh, would like to read? Three things. Three things. Well, uh, yeah. the, the, regarding Newman, I know a number of very good friends with a number of oratorians, and to a one, they all tell me that to this day, the best study and biography of Newman is Newman's, uh, is Boyer's spiritual and intellectual biography mm. that hasn't been surpassed. I mean, Ian Carr's wow. book is great. Sheridan Gilley's book is great. But to un the, the, the best book that under the book that best understands Newman and presents him is still Boyer's biography. Uh, secondly, uh, the, the, you referenced to Tolkien reminded me the very beginning of the meaning of a ma monastic life, there's this beautiful sort of description of the cosmos that, that and creation that, that Boyer paints that to me, it is so resonant uh, with or redolent of uh, the beginning of the Silmarillion of Tolkien. Absolutely. He and quotes Gregory of, is it Gregory of Nyssa that he quotes that beautiful passage? Yeah. yeah. It, so, it sounds like the, that Tolkien could have lifted. Yeah. The Silmarillion the, 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 that. That's fascinating. Yeah. It's fascinating to me when I was reading. It's like, this sounds just like Tolkien. Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, and, and then I think this is a, my final thought. A book needs to be written by a good historical theologian on. Parisian theology, Catholic and Orthodox, and the interpenetration from 1920 to 1960. Mm. Yes. You know, you just reminded me of something that popped into my head half an hour ago when you were talking about Bouillet's years in Paris. And I was wondering, did he know Clément? I mean, and, and did he interact? I mean, there was such a sort of large Russian Orthodox community of intellectuals in Paris, as well as Catholic, a flourishing of Catholic artists, literary figures, philosophers, theologians. What a period of time and place Paris must have been intellectually as a Catholic during that period of time. And it's the same time that, that you know, you've got the, the, the sort of cafe philosophs of, you know, yeah. uh, Simone yeah. de Beauvoir and, and Jean-Paul yeah. they're all They're all there. You know, they're all, that's Paris. Like, 
you could have been, they could have been sitting at a cafe smoking and, and kibitzing about their non-belief in God. And, you know, George Florovsky could have wandered by or, you know, or <laughs> Brier could have been yeah. smoking a cigarette or something right outside. And we'd never, you know, like, that was all so concentrated in that one city. Yep. Yeah. Kind of reminds me of here. No, not at all. Uh, uh, that's great. Well, before we uh, sign off, I just like, I always like to ask my guests if there's any, uh, I mean, I, I'm sort of directing the conversation with my, with my questions. Um, if there's anything else, last words that you guys would like to add before we sign off here, we'll start with Dr. Lemna. I just want to encourage your viewers who are interested in theology to give Bouye a chance. And I think you will be rewarded by looking into his work. All we are saying is give Bouye a chance. There we go. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yes. I agree with that. That's that. I endorse that message. Monsignor Heinz, last uh, words. Just a word to thank Dr. Lemna for his work because he's done a great deal of work in making Bouye accessible and also providing a doorway for people to start. Um, I would encourage uh, readers, people who've never read Bouye, um, you might start with something as simple as uh, the introduction to spiritual life. Uh, it gives you a taste of Bouye. Um, Clooney Media has published, uh, republished a number of his books now that are available in paperback. Um, a lot of his stuff still is just, it's just out of print. And so uh, yeah. uh, John Clark at, at, at uh, Clooney's done a wonderful job too of making his works available again. And so, uh, yeah, I think what you'll find is you'll walk away intellectually ed nourished and spiritually edified. By Bouye. Uh, thank you. I couldn't. I couldn't agree more, gentlemen. Thank you so much for this conversation. I feel like thank in you, a lot Larry. of ways we're just. It's so hard to really dig down deep into these profound thinkers in like an hour and ten minutes or so, uh, via you know these sort of videos and things. But we try. I try to sort of get it out of people, and uh, you guys really, really moved the needle and, and fostered a great conversation here today. I really want to thank both of you and i really i you know like i said i'm a pure amateur when it comes to bouye uh but i've read enough to know that man is that guy fruitful and his voice is so needed so thank you gentlemen for being here today and um thank you to my viewers for watching thank right. you all. thank you larry